Welcome to the Short Vol Show, as we did see Contango going above 5, above 6, above 7, and above 8 yesterday with, um, of course, the markets rallying and um, getting near all-time highs again. Um, this isn't something that's too shocking as uh, we're just in this sort of summer mode here. You know, you get a down day or two and people start to say this and that. But um, in general, the rally just kind of rolling on here. Um, here's a look at E-minis here over the past uh, couple months. And that's kind of been the story. Um, um, despite political... Uh, some say turmoil, others say uh, a great job by the administration, depending on where you uh, sit on the political uh, spectrum. Um, and today um, we have uh, exciting stuff going on in the uh, in my little world. Um, doing an interview at 11 o'clock with uh, the guy from The Balance of Trade. If you follow me on Facebook, you can see me posting a lot from his uh, Seeking Alpha column, which comes out, um, can come out more than once a week. Um, Adam's a really cool guy. He's a professor in um, um, in uh, Arizona, and but he... Um, and um, he part of his sort of graduate stuff actually i think he was already a professor when he did it but he um became interested in etfs and then specifically uh, uh vix etfs and um did some academic research which has been uh, influential and um when i caught up with him last he was actually um um had brought his family to the far east for a few months um and very interesting family. Uh, his wife has a, blo a travel blog, and they they homeschool school their kids. And um, real interesting, unique guy. So I uh, want to catch up with him later today. See uh, he's back in the U.S. and see how he's uh, what he's been up to lately. And uh, meanwhile, um, although that was uh, that was all set up to go a couple of days ago, I got. Um, Invited to come on the show at the uh, Options uh, uh, Network with uh, with Mark Longo, which is great, a uh, huge honor, and um, get to hang out. It's amazing because the guys on the show, Andrew and Mark, well, we all went. We all used to work for the same company, and uh, which uh, in Chicago, and but we worked kind of at sort of at different times. Well, in a way. I mean, Andrew got there first, um, and then uh, and then I showed up, and Andrew and I worked for a long time there together. Then I think Andrew left first, and then I left, and then Mark uh, showed up there, uh, Mark Sebastian. So, um, so I don't believe I don't think that I Mark and I overlapped at all um, together in the company. Although I I think I was still. Um, on the floor working for a different company when he showed up or I had, might have gone across the street to the uh, Chicago Board of Trade by the time uh, Mark Sebastian got to Group 1. But anyways, it's kind of just remarkable what a small world this is, this options trading world and how we, we all ended up working for the exact same company there. Now, there's a ton of different companies on the floor, but as far as really respected market maker firms, um, they actually had a floor presence at the SIBO. Um, Group one was one of the bigger ones. There were several smaller ones that just basically conducted their their business within like one pit, maybe. 
Um, and there are several really good firms that were successfully made a ton of money. Um, I think what's what set Group One apart was the uh, the training program where they they really decided that they were going to make a go at um, at educating people, and they actually had more to offer than other firms because they had some of the original um, guys in the options business from, um, uh, for example, there's this guy, Gary Sparks, who's one of the partners, and um, he really developed some of the um, the way of using the sheets uh, to value options. When he first started, there were only call options, I think, and not puts, but people like him and um, Blair Hull, I guess Blair Hull came up with a way to value options using the Black and Scholes model. I mean, he didn't come up with it, but he, he was the one who started first generating trading sheets that he could sort of hand out to traders to sort of evaluate their positions in a more, in a better way than just sort of supply and demand so that you could kind of uh, evaluate one option versus another and sort of start to model them. Uh, and then Gary Sparks, um, I think that as the story goes, was buying these trading sheets from Blair Hall initially. Although they were they were in different spots. I'm not sure if Gary came to the SIBO or not. Maybe Andrew would know more about this. But if Gary came to the SIBO or if he was in San Francisco the whole time. But um, other Group 1 partners such as Terry Brookshire. Um, uh, of course, Bill Grabitis, uh, uh, uh Steve. Um, and... Um, there were a whole bunch of people back then who who were in Group One who were very influential at setting up a uh, a way of bringing people along, like new new talent and kids along into uh, trading. And uh, because the time before them, what was happening was on the floor is basically like people would bring traders on and they just bring in a comp a bunch of people and give them a shot, and most of them would wouldn't make it but a couple of them survived and became traders and that was if you listen to uh like tom sosnoff um and um tony batista from um tasty trade talk about what sort of way they were bringing up people through the floor when they first started out they really they admit to the fact that they like really had not much of a clue what was going on and just kind of they were taught by other traders in the pit to just kind of sort, sort of uh, respond to order flow and move the markets during to order flow and whatnot but as far as a real theoretical basis and uh the kind of analysis that is really commonplace today at you know betting one to to gain three or looking at historical volatility all these things were kind of foreign to floor traders floor traders kind of got down there bullied their way in and there there's definitely some dynamics on the floor of actually you know being a bully pulling that order flow away from people moving the markets um keeping people away from you all those dynamics uh, were at play but group one and other groups were able to add um uh, uh, additional level of sophistication and modeling to that and continue to be on the front lines of um, developing nowadays software, which is incredibly important. Um, as we came through um, the, uh, the 90s, uh, computers were becoming more and more evident uh, on the floor and we were handed by the exchange these black little boxes to... Uh, to trade with. When I first started, we were writing tickets, and then you would take one part of the ticket. There was a thing called a belt, which is like a conveyor belt in front of you, and you'd drop your ticket in the conveyor belt, and they would all end up in one spot, and people would have to correlate them and figure everything out. That was replaced by uh, these handheld devices where you would kind of point it at a, uh, a wireless thing, and and when a broker, broker would send you a trade, and you'd hit accept. But besides just the apparatus of execution of trades we also had our own our own software and we had these handheld displays strapped around our necks which is basically a, a tablet that we can model our positions on um and that we could um communicate with people traders that were in, on other exchanges that were trading the same products as us um, et cetera, et cetera. And all that technology had to be developed and it was all very clunky. Um, you know, we were always trying to get new batteries. If your battery ran out, um, 
you were in trouble, especially when I was at the Board of Trade when I needed to use my computer to execute futures uh, in the, um, the bonds. I mean, you could like signal over to the pit next to you to trade futures, but it, it became easier just to click a button on your screen. But the thing is, is like if your battery went out, then you're screwed. <laughs> and, uh, and the same thing uh, in the options, like um, once it became a bad, a war of multi-listing, you know, and a stock was listed on many exchanges, uh, a broker would come quote a big order and they quote it on all the different exchanges. And so if there's two group one traders, one on each exchange, uh, wherever the order trades we want as much of it as we can if it's a good order and we sort of divvy it up so they're quoting a spread 5,000 times I might go to the guy in New York okay if it trades there can you get me 200 I'll do 200 of it and so if it trades in New York maybe he would take down 500 and he'd give me 200 well all that back-end software to like pass those options trades in between uh, the different traders at group one figuring everything out P&L wise uh, error correction, all this stuff needed to be developed. And, um, and so it was an exciting time working with software companies and being at the front lines of developing software, uh, and theory. Meanwhile, the, you know, the original Black and Scholes model was being, um, tweaked and there were, there were all of a sudden competing models, binomial, um, um, I can't list all the models cause I can't remember them all, but, um, there was there were all these innovations coming down the the pipeline all the time, so it was an exciting time. Um, so, anyways, uh, this whole ramble is to say that it's just uh, fascinating that all of a sudden, years later, we would all find ourselves uh, on a program together. Um, um, it wouldn't have been predicted by us at, at the time. I mean, if you look at um, Andrew and I, we're, we're pretty much the most unlikely people to be hanging out with each other like 20 years later or something because we have completely different personalities. And, and uh, we sort of knew that at the time, too, of like of the you know 50 people who were hanging out together in group one at the time, the least likely two people to like be hanging out in a program 20 years later would be Andrew and I. <laughs> um, and I guess people at the time would know would know that so that's it's it's kind of ironic anyway um happy uh friday the 13th um let's take a, a brief look at markets here um and to do that i'm going to kind of try and recenter the screen here a little bit let's see if i can do this right okay because it's too big all right so um right now e is down 75 cents um Dow futures up six, NASDAQ up 75 cents. And we really got a move overnight. Um, checking in earlier in the uh, the day today or late last night, we were up a lot higher in these issues. Um, the VIX was getting hammered yesterday uh, late at night. And now we've um, stuff sold off down to the point where it's like on, let me see if I can pull up a, a chart that's more uh, just the last few hours. And you can see behind me the uh, the sell off here from the levels of even three in the morning um, at the start of that chart there to now. So uh, stuff moving around a little bit um, into the open here. However, you know, once again, going back to the original chart we had we are at pretty high levels here so um and uh we are coming into expiration next week um let's take a look at i like to go to the uvxy pro shares website to check out it just it just always reminds me of uh where we are as far as the uh in the expiration cycle so let me move this over to the screen where you can see it here so i just to get here i usually just type in uh uvxy into my um browser and then uh pick out the ProShares website so we've seen and when you look at these holdings um you can see there's these swaps here now this is this has been going on for a while now this whole swap thing um 
but it's just it's cheaper ways for them to a accomplish the same thing. Um, I believe pretty much the ratio between these two futures here is shown, which is 551 to 95, um, still represents the right ratio that it should be this day of the month. Remember here, um, the top future we see behind me here is the uh, August future and the lower one is July. The July one expiring on the 18th of July coming up um, in a few days and the August one expiring on the 22nd of August. And we can see there's a lot more August right now. So every day, uh, however many days there are in the expiration cycle, let's say 30, 1 30th of the July futures are sold and replaced with the August futures. So if we look at our VIX Central here, and you can see the July future now trading uh, 13.50, uh, well, the, well, the August one trading 1448. Now, of course, this VIX central thing is delayed by a few minutes, but you get the point. Um, so every day they have to sell some of these futures for 1350, the cheaper price, and buy the same dollar amount of futures, which is going to be less for 1448. So when they do the roll, it's not like money is lost right there because they're whatever amount of dollars worth that they sell of uh, the, the lower price one. They're buying the same dollar amount of the higher price one. So the, this is co confusing to a lot of people that the loss from Contango is not right here. This is like a sort of like an E equals MC squared thing in that it's not created or lost. It's a zero sum game when they replace one with the other. The whole loss comes from these two futures, these two blue dots falling towards spot so you can see which of these two dots which would you rather have if you know they're they're both going to fall to the bottom there and however much the distances that they fall is the amount of money you make well you're going to want more of the one that's farther away from spot because that one has more to fall and if you make money each dollar it falls you're going to make more money from the one that's farther away uh so as time goes by um, the amount that you have to fall to spot increases because you keep switching with futures that are farther away from spot. And that allows you to always be sort of falling towards spot, even if the VIX doesn't move. So um, essentially the distance underneath um, these two futures, that distance between them and spot is your, your profitability potential. So if I take my little snipping tool here and I cut out this area, um, that'll allow me to sort of draw on here. So this distance here is all your profit potential, right? So every time we roll, we're switching more futures to this 1448 one, and that's giving you, that's increasing your profit potential. Um, all things being equal, you've just got these slowly falling towards spot. And if we were to fast forward with nothing changing until expiration, this 1350 would go straight down to 1254. So, um, all this, um, so if you're short VIX ETFs, then this move between the 1350 and the 1254, that move down is extra money in your pocket if you're a short. Um, you, you make whatever money you make from vol coming in, but whether vol comes in or goes out, you, you, you're going to end up making this extra money between here and here. And as they roll out, you can see that there's more money to be made here. Um, and so some people are, if you look on, um, Twitter, there is some like sort of, um, VIX guys who are sort of purists or whatever, and they, they consider Contango to not be... Right here on the chart, the, uh, Contango is sort of defined as the, uh, the slope between these two futures, the M1 and M2 future, and that's the general definition that's used of Contango. But um, some uh, a guy online, I forget who he was, but uh, a guy on, on Twitter recently was saying... No, no, his definition of contango is the slope between 
the spot, so 1254 and the front future, or spot and the mix of the two futures that's, that's defined today. So, um, because the, the relationship that matters, if you forget about rebalancing, the relationship that matters, like at one, if you take a snapshot in time, uh, we might be like right here on the chart because right now we are like mostly the second future and a little bit of the first future. So in time, we might be like right where I drew it, right where I drew there in the chart. So if you freeze everything in time, the relationship that matters right now is the difference between this part that my line intersects with the slope and spot. And so um, if you were to take whatever that number is, let's say it's 1420, okay? So if you were to take 1420, and here is gonna, you're going to get my awful handwriting here with a mouse. So if you were to take 1420... Okay, and you were to subtract 1254, and you were to, to subtract 1254, you would get uh, 166. Okay, and so then if you take 166 and you divide that by that 1254 spot, you would get uh, 13 percent 13.23 percent so this guy's definition of contango is um the slope between spot and wherever we are in the curve right now in the mix of futures and right now that number uh if you do the math would be 13.23 percent uh, so i'm going to try to draw with my chicken scratch again with this if you can believe it my writing is actually even worse with a pen than it is with uh, using my pointer. I'm just, I'm terrible at writing. Um, my mom always says that my, I don't know, it was like third grade teacher, it's m my third grade teacher, Mrs. Otavi's fault that I, I can't write. So anyways, this guy would consider contango to be 13.24% um, as opposed to the difference between just the two futures. And it's kind of interesting to think of it that way because that actually is the distance we need to go right now the distance we need to go to get to spot between these two to fall there is is uh, the slope of that distance is 13.24. Now, we're never going to reach that because that distance um, is, is going to occur over time. But this is sort of like the potential, the potential distance if, if this were to go to spot today. Now, this isn't going to go to spot anytime. The only thing that's going to that's gonna converge to a spot is the front month future. But... Right now, that is the potential that we have set up in this VIX term structure, which is, um, you know, decent potential. Um, if we go to Contango, if we go back, let me get rid of my snipping tool here, and we go back to our actual chart, we can click Contango, and uh, we can look at the level of Contango versus the last 10 years, which um, you can see we've... Any time above this red line means that we're getting positive decay. And you can see we're, we've almost always been in positive decay this whole time. And when you look at this chart, you can see we're kind of building back up this year to kind of where we were for a while. And we're in a, you know, we're, it we're, seems like we're kind of pretty near the mean as far as contango goes over the last few years. And uh, we are moving higher. So that's cool. Um, of course, the light blue line is what we're most looking at here. So um, when you hear people, the short vol people talking about contango and all this stuff, um, this is some of what they're talking about. Um, now, these are forces that are pulling down on VIX ETPs, um, but they're, they're slow moving forces. And this is like 13 that number was 13% over time, over a month, or 8% contango that we were seeing yesterday. Right now, showing contango level of, um, I think it's like 7%, let's see. 
7.26%, meaning that these things, all things equal, will decay by 7% per month. Um, that being TVX, UVXY, VXX. Um, now, the main force, though, is uh, volatility, the VIX, and you know VIX futures moving about. Um, this contango, though, is always grinding against you slowly. Um, but right now, the VIX kind of in a lower spot from where it's been recently. So some people um, will inevitably play this to the long side because we're um, in a lower spot than we have been recently in the VIX. Um, you can see all those outliers on the screen. That's really weird. That's like bad data, all those little down things. I'm not sure why there's so many lately, but here's a you know a, a year chart of the VIX, and you can see we're kind of at a, a, a lower level than we have been um, since the uh, lowest level we've been at since the spike almost. Um, I guess we got down to 11.58 maybe in uh, the beginning of June, but we're close. We're, we're in a point of the lows here. So um, that's why you'll see people um, getting long vol. Um, I outline that the um, challenges all the time to getting long vol and how it's a uh, it's not a good idea at least with the imperfect uh, tools we have to get long vol um, at this point uh, from all the uh, reasons that I've explained to you before but um, if you are going to take a stand this is a better spot certainly than if the VIX were at like 16 or 17. Um, any sort of bad news is going to pop this back up towards 15 and you will see a, a, a corresponding rally in the uh, ETPs. But right now, UVXY under 10, trading 989, 990 as we come into the day. Um, and let's take a brief look and see what we got coming up on the docket today as far as numbers. And for that, I'm going to go to barchart.com and we can check out our buddy uh, Nick. Um, and we do once again have a Friday the 13th. So we've got um, preliminary UOM consumer sentiment is out at 10, revised UOM inflation expectations out at 10, Fed monetary policy report out at 11. Um, if we do go to Drudge Report, May has wrecked Brexit. The deal is off. Sunstroke. Trump calls interview fake. Uh, Daily Caller. Uh, da, 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 da. Senate Dems blast former Trump attorney for selling access. Feds collect record taxes. Bezos, two hundred million dollar ticket to space. Let's check or two hundred k ticket to space. Let's check this out. All right, folks, please, <laughs> please um, give to Patreon so that I can get a ticket to space. <laughs> I'm only uh, one hundred thousand uh, ninety dollars short. <laughs> um, wouldn't that be fun to to go up into space? That would be awesome. I would think it would cost more than that, two or three hundred grand. But um, wouldn't it be great to do that? That would be a lot of fun. I've been watching a bunch of stuff from the uh, International Space Station lately. Um, there's a ton of videos online from there. I've been checking that out. That would certainly be fun. Um, and I do want to mention um, I need help with this channel. Um, I had an initial Patreon um push and a couple people signed up and I'm grateful to them um, but since then um, nobody's really helped out and um, I can assure you that I take a lot of time and effort into um, putting the show together and um, would love some support just so that I can pay the bills as far as keeping the, uh, the power on updating some equipment I want to have a like be able I want to be able to go live uh, and go on the road to interview people. Um, 
and I'm not looking for a huge amount of support, but maybe, you know, if you could afford five bucks a month, I know how many stock services and things there are out there that cost way more than that. But, um, Patreon, I, um, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to my supporters on Patreon. Um, thank you for, uh, for your support. Um, but please, uh, consider joining if you haven't already, because, um, you know, it just a couple people helping out. It makes a huge amount of leverage. Um, and let's see if I can, I want to list my supporters here for you to, to thank those of you who have, um, signed up, um, because uh, I am certainly grateful to those who have signed up. Um, uh, Brent, major supporter, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, Jane Snodgrass, thank you so much. Grateful. Kevin Quinn, thank you so much. Mark O, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Mike Kaiser, uh, Great. Thank you so much, buddy. And Seth Golden, of course, thank you for all your support and all you do behind the scenes. Um, it's funny. Uh, so some of the people from Patreon have become some of my most sort of trusted advisors, even a small business venture like mine, which is sort of becoming a business venture in the last few months, um, needs a lot of advice. And I actually turn to a lot of these people uh, who've been supporting me from the beginning for that sort of advice. Um, and you, you folks know that that's true. Um, so, um, thanks again. Um, if, uh, to, uh, to Jane and Kevin and Mark, um, reach out to me or, and I'll reach out to you as far as, um, anything I can do for you to help you, um, with your trading and in the, um, um, and anything I can do for you is to, to, to say thank you for, uh, hooking me up with, uh, with that Patreon, a uh, couple bucks. Uh, you know, it's only a buck or two, you know, if you can even give like a buck, then it puts you on the list and, um, I'm super grateful. And, uh, you know, I'm currently, I'm not, um, selling anything specific. I'm not, I have no, um, source of income for this channel other than, um, I do have one advertiser, um, uh, Gorilla Trade, which I'm great. I'm very grateful for. Um, and I've got Patreon, uh, which I'm also very grateful for. Um, but, um, and I get a little bit of revenue from AdSense. So thank you very much. Uh, I do want to, um, announce that, um, the channel does have a new partner. Um, and, um, this coming about, just yesterday, um, we, um, we've picked up a musical, um, a musical partner, uh, Ruth Ann Mendoza, who you can hear in the background here, has, uh, authorized us to use her music for our video. So I will be providing a link to her, uh, at the bottom of all videos and please check her out on, uh, YouTube. She's a uh, um, great talent, a great upcoming talent. So please check her out. So anyways, um, I've been babbling on for a while today and I got to get going because I need to prepare for this uh, two interviews coming up today. But um, let me also just say that um, we've got exciting, exciting stuff coming up for the channel. I have... Um, three really exciting new people that I've never actually talked to in person before who are coming on the show in the next month. Uh, I think you're going to be really um, excited to see them. Uh, the theme lately is I'm going to be talking to um, some of the top people who, uh, who offer education in the options industry online through YouTube. Um, you can, uh, you can speculate on the names, but I have, um, if you, if you think of the top, um, the top YouTube options, teaching, um, websites, 
um, those are the kind of people that are coming on the program coming up, uh, which is really exciting. Um, it's a small little niche we're in in the YouTube world finance. It's funny. I went on this uh, website. I think it's called Isaiah, uh, which has its influencer marketing and services. And it's like uh, I was checking out Isaiah because the stock totally exploded yesterday and I happened to see it. Um, if we look at the stock today, Isaiah, okay, um, this is the history in the last couple of months. It's kind of off the screen there. Let me kind of fix that. But um, ripped, ripped yesterday from uh, from a buck up to, I think it got up to like 280 and then sort of back down uh, to $2 today. But um, this is one of many companies that's trying to connect um, people that are influencers online that have YouTube channels and whatnot with uh, adver potential advertisers. Now, there are uh, a bunch of people on YouTube who are extremely successful and, you know, have millions of followers and whatnot. Um, you know, I fall on the very small uh, end of things, like, um, you know, with less than 10,000 subscribers right now, I'm a very small YouTuber. Big YouTubers don't, um, you know, once you're really successful, um, it's very easy to get advertising deals and whatnot. Um, the deal that I have with Guerrilla Trades, please check them out. Uh, they're really cool people. Um, I, I, I basically just went out and got it. I, I actually did connect with them through a, um, a website that connects influencers, but I didn't use the website sort of format. I just kind of used the website to find them and then kind of took things off of that network after that and d dealt with them directly. Um, I would recommend that if you're, um, if you have a YouTube channel and you're looking to, to get, um, sponsorship, but this, um, Isaiah caught my eye just because of the stock trading yesterday, and I did check out the website. Um, it's kind of weird, I guess is what I would use to describe it. it. It has these, like, offers or whatever so that, like, uh, where they say, okay, well, we'll give you, like, five bucks if you do this little video thing for us, or we'll give you two bucks or 10 bucks or something like that. And for me, even for me, who's a very small YouTuber, it, it's not really worth it to me to like do something for two bucks. I mean, uh, I'd rather just go to my side job or something. Um, look at this Toyota owners. Okay. The bids $2 to, we're looking at people who own a Toyota and who love their vehicle. We'd like you to take a picture in front of your vehicle holding a sign that reads, love my Toyota, and send it to them. Okay, it's not that much to take a picture and send it to them, but this is like a waste of my time because uh, to make two bucks to go through all this hassle. And they want you to like get the upgraded plan where you're paying them five bucks a month to find these things. Here's another thing. Make this video and you get 20 bucks. Now, you know, I understand if you're like a little kid and you have a YouTube channel and, you you know, your your allowance is run out for the week, maybe you want to make this little video. But if you're like a real influencer, you want to make an ad deal with somebody that's actually going to get you some money. You know what I mean? That's going to like actually pay your bills. I mean, people actually have bills like rent and, uh, you know, power, uh, cameras and that sort of stuff. And this website, it doesn't, it doesn't, I can't tell like who its audience is. I think that if you want to make money in this industry, you got to go after some of the bigger fishes. And uh, it, this seems to be going after the, the really little people. When you see a website that's trying to get money actually from the content creators as opposed to hooking them up with the advertisers, the advertisers are the one with the money. They're the ones who should be paying, not the content creators. Content creators create content and advertisers help support them. So this is kind of backwards it seems to me that you pay five bucks a month to i guess to go to be able to be first in line to bid for these like two dollar tasks anyways i don't totally get it but and when i look at this website i'm like uh, i'm not sure if i would want to like be real long on uh, this stock and as you can see it did come from seven dollars on down okay so um let's just get to um i do want to 
highlight the two stocks that we've been watching the last uh, few days. So let's do that. Um, so we've got IQ, which is, uh, once again, the Chinese sort of Netflix, which has been doing really well the last couple of days since we started watching it. It's up $4. Um, and once again, volatility is very high in this issue. Um, I was recommending maybe doing some sort of a buy right thing where you, instead of just getting long the stock, you, you, you buy the stock and sell some out of the money calls against it since volatility is very high this way. Um, if it just stays still, you collect decent money. If it goes higher, maybe the stock, you make money on your long stock and maybe it gets called away from you or you roll out your short calls before it gets called away. But either way, um, when I see a meaty uh, stock with volatilities over 100 in many cases here, uh, I want to sell something. <laughs> uh, and I see, definitely see that with IQ and um, options. Uh, scanners are picking this one up like crazy um the other one that i was talking about recently has been uh acorn so let's pull up acorn for a second so if i go to my stock twits here akrx so um, this is a deal stock where the deal is sort of partially fallen through but vol is really high there's rumors that the deal might keep uh might be still alive so um vol is really high um so let's take a look at this one so 1860 you've seen it you've seen the gap down when the deal was called off and now it's been rallying off the lows of like 12 so um Another one where this could rip up or down at any moment, but in the meantime, might be a spot if you're a brave soul to sell a little premium here. Um, do check it out. Uh, the other one that I was caught my eye was I was reading an article the the other day about um, uh, for profit prisons and how the Trump administration had supported. Uh, you know, was a boom for pr for profit prisons, and so I said, I said, well, let's check out a look at the symbols. So I found a CXW. So if we pull up CXW, uh, the chart tells us kind of a different story than what the media has been saying. So fake news. <laughs> uh, so you see it um, pretty much since Trump got elected, this has gone down. Now that. The, the media was saying, oh, it's a great boon for these stocks that Trump was elected. But if we look, your chart, okay. Um, well, that does look different. I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Your chart rally. Um, let's back this up to um, three years. Okay, so, um, so yeah, big, big move. Um, huge move here. So Trump elected... And then um, ra huge rally here, but then huge sell-off. So it's been all over the board. That's kind of a crazy chart right there. Uh, this is a for-profit prison. And I'm going to actually research this and see what actually happens here. But crazy chart, huh? Uh, and here's the other one I was looking at, Geo. And um, once again, um, crazy chart. I don't know what happened here either i need to research that too but um for profit prisons does the trend continue um or um or does a new administration come in and try to limit some of this stuff um kind of interesting stuff uh, the other one i've been sort of following is this i think these guys make like missile guidance systems bay systems um i've been following that re lately as um if i get a if we get a big pullback in this one i think i might purchase a little bit of this one um it's interesting to me um in mj news uh 
there's obviously a lot going on sort of behind the scenes in the U.S. and the public um, where there's more and more support for the marijuana laws, et cetera, et cetera. But as far as the, uh, the stocks uh, kind of hanging in, a, in, a, in an orbit right now, um, if you've been following Canopy over the last few days, not a whole lot to report um, with either Canopy or Afria. Uh, I am long Afria from, I think, like 925, something like that. Now it's down a little bit from there, just hanging out. That is sort of a long-term sort of hold for me. Here is Canopy over the last couple of years. You can see the huge explosion over the last couple of years. Uh, and with that high, which was basically right, I believe, right before it was listed in the New York Stock Exchange. Um, but... I do believe that this will continue, and we will see that um, happen soon, I think. I think this will take out the highs at some point in the next year. So um, this chart right here is a little bit elusive because it's only showing between 30 and 36. The real story is um, the bigger picture from where it came from, which is more like that chart. Um, and obviously this thing could back down to the 20 level pretty easily it looks like so um marijuana stocks very very volatile um so that's what i'm kind of looking at right now um my biggest position is currently in tesla where i have a um calendar spread on um i still have a little bit of a short in uvxy but um small and um that's where things stand right now. Um, I am interested in, um, I got to figure out, maybe somebody can tell me in the comments how I know VXST got replaced, right, by VX9D, VX9D. And I can't get that symbol to come up on my thinkorswim, VX9D. And I'm just wondering, how do I... Um, get the new VXST to appear on my thinkorswim? If you know the answer to that one, please leave it in the comments because I've been trying to figure that out for a couple days. The other one is VXMT has been replaced by um, VXSM, uh, which is stands for VS six months. So, you know, the, the short-term VX has been replaced by nine-day VX, and the medium-term VX is replaced by six-month VX. But I can't seem to get them to appear on my on my um, Thinkorswim platform. If you know how to do that, please uh, let me know in the, in the comments. Anyway, thanks for watching today. Um, I am scheduled to have an interview with... Um, Adam starting at 11 o'clock Eastern Central Time, but I'm not um, sure if I'm going to broadcast that live or not. Um, so uh, stay tuned. That might be broadcast live. However, um, I'm definitely going to be appearing at 1 o'clock today on um, the um, on uh, Volatility Views. So uh, please check that out. It I believe it's broadcast on um, Mixler. Um, let me just pull that up for you real quick here so you have it. Um, let's take a look here. So how do I get this? Okay, so from I'm going to pull it up on Facebook so that you have it because I believe... I can find it here. Let me just go to Options Insider here. Okay, so if you go to the Options Insider, you can find us there. Options Insider Network. Uh, you can go to Volatility Views here, and you can find us on there. Um, through um, you know iTunes, Stitcher, and MXLR. So please check that out at 1 o'clock. I'm really excited. It's an honor for me to be on the show. It's a big moment for me, and uh, I'd love to have you check it out. And um, thanks for watching today. Uh, the show is a little longer today, um, but a lot of stuff going on. It's very exciting, and I'm uh, working on a big project, which I'm not 
allowed to talk about right now. But um, suffice to say, I'm working on a big project, which is very exciting. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. And welcome Ruth in Mendoza to the Shortfall Show family. Thank you.